Dr. Neha Patak, and you're listening to Health Discovered, the show dedicated to taking on important topics and discussing what they mean for your health. As always, we bring you fascinating stories and unique perspectives while looking for unexpected discoveries along the way. We'll also explore thought-provoking ideas and questions like this one. We've all gotten the message that we should get regular exercise. But is exercise something that we, as humans, really evolved to do? Here to help us answer that question is evolutionary biologist and author of the book, Exercised, Daniel Lieberman. So welcome, Dr. Lieberman. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here. So you are a paleobiologist and professor of evolutionary biology. What exactly does that mean? <laughs> How do you spend your work life? Well, I'm, I study human evolution in particular. I'm an evolutionary biologist who focuses on the evolution of human beings. Uh, and I, and my, my focus really is on how and why the human body is the way it is, especially human physical activity. So I, um, I combine field work. So I, I, I work in mostly in Kenya, but I also do some work in Mexico and other places like that. I, I do lots of work in the lab. So we do experimental biomechanics and physiology in my lab. And I also study the fossil record of human evolution. So I'm interested in, you know, fossils and old bones that, that tell us, you know, the, the, uh, how, how we got to be the way we are. And so by combining those three different lines of inquiry, um, I study uh, really the evolution of the human body from head to toe. That's great. So what should, and we'll get more into this as we go on with our conversation, but what should we know about physical activity and our past to inform our health in the modern world? Well, I think it's important to, I mean, to understand that we evolved to be very physically active creatures. Our closest relatives are chimpanzees. So we, we come from the ape part of the family tree. And chimpanzees, gorillas, orangutans, the other living apes are all basically couch potatoes. And um, they don't really do very much. If you ever get a chance to watch gorillas or chimpanzees in the wild, they basically spend most of their days just sitting on their butts feeding. That's what that's what apes do. Um, and they're basically inactive relative to most other species. But but at some point in our human evolution, we evolved to become long distance walkers. We evolved to carry. We evolved to run. We evolved to be very physically active, so we could get a very high quality diet. And so physical activity is sort of woven into our biology in a very special way. It's also important in, in an, another interesting way, which is that we not only evolved to be physically active, we also evolved to be physically active late into life. So most animals die uh, when they stop reproducing. Very few animals live beyond the age of reproduction. But hunter-gatherers, um, our ancestors uh, as well, uh, tend to live a good two decades or so after they stop reproducing. And in those two decades, they don't retire and you know move to Florida or something like that. They, they, they stay extremely active, uh, hunting, gathering, preparing food, etc. And importantly, it's that physical activity which helps them stay healthy. So we all know that exercise is healthy, but the reason that I think it's so healthy actually is that we evolved to to stay physically active for a very long lifespan, and we evolved all kinds of ways in which that physical activity promotes health slows down senescence. It, so in other words, being physically active is just woven into our biology in a very fundamental way. So I think that's great. And you mentioned a term there, senescence. So I'd love to kind of talk a bit about that a little bit and, and how that relates to health span and not just lifespan. Oh, I love that question. So of course, aging is just getting older, right? We all inevitably age, but senescence is the is sort of the breakdown uh, that occurs with age, right? You know, the your you know certain cells lose their function. You your your muscles can't repair themselves as rapidly. You know, uh, you get buildup of 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 inflammation and uh, byproducts and and so on, and they, they, they clock up our brains and and arteries and God knows what else, right? And so senescence is is really. Um, a major cause of morbidity of illness. And until recently, um, we focus often on lifespan when we think about health. But um, but until recently, before, before me the invention of medicine, or at least modern medicine, lifespan equaled healthspan, right? Healthspan is how long you live without major chronic disease. 
And um, until recently, your your lifespan was your health span. And you know, when people started getting sick towards the end of life, they they died pretty quickly. Now, of course, people can live a very long period of time. Right? Uh, the average American's lifespan now is seventy nine. Their average health span is sixty three, uh, which is quite remarkable. And uh, but that's really made possible by medicine and sanitation and various you know innovations that didn't used to exist. And and importantly, and here's what's where it really is so important: physical activity is important because it extends health span. Study after study after study shows that people who are more physically active have a longer health span because there it's it slows senescence, it turns on all kinds of repair and maintenance mechanisms, and it also prevents our bodies from investing in processes like building up fat, having overly high hormone levels, for example, that that um, that accelerate senescence and, and disease. So that's really interesting. I'd like to kind of Think about where you're working and what you're seeing. So you said that your work involves basically living with and studying people who live in remote locations with lifestyles that are maybe closer in line with our evolutionary history. So they live more like hunter-gatherers. Yeah. I mean, look, um, today... Most of the people, maybe all of the people listening to this this show, are what we call weird people. Right? Weird <laughs> stands for Western educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic. And weird folks like us are about nine ten percent of the world. Still, most of the planet today um, doesn't live uh, a post industrial lifestyle. And of course, until a few generations ago, nobody lived the way we do. You know, flying around in airplanes and eating breakfast cereal out of a box and and all those other strange things that we think is normal, but but really aren't, right? Uh, just just take for example, you know, when you want to get a glass of water, right? You just go over to the tap and you turn it, and whoosh, out comes water, right? Until recently, nobody had that. You know, you had to go. You wanted water, you had to go to a well and pump it. Even in major cities like London and Paris, you know, there were wells. I mean, just down the just down the road here at Harvard Yard, there was a well that all the Harvard undergraduates had to go pump their water when they wanted to wash their face in the morning. So. There's so many ways in which our, our our world has shifted, and if you really want to understand human bodies and, and why they are the, the way they are and how they function, you can't just study people in Boston or New York or you know United States. You have to go and look at people who use their bodies as our ancestors did, and so that's. And furthermore, we have a, a global health crisis, right? As obesity and diabetes and and cancer and heart disease are spreading around the world. We need to think not just about these diseases here, but also how to help not just treat, but also especially prevent them in other countries. So there's an urgent need to to go to other parts of the world to study uh, to study human biology. And plus, we learn a lot about our about all human beings, including people in weird countries like the United States. I I love that um, thinking about ourselves as weird people. So how do we, as the weird people, stack up with regard to physical activity in terms of hours? First of all, let's you know one of the things that's weird about weird people is exercise, right? Physical activity is just moving; it's like doing stuff, right? Um, but exercise is discretionary, voluntary physical activity for the sake of health and fitness. And until recently, because people were physically active all the time and struggling to get enough food, nobody exercised. I mean, I'm, this morning, for example, I worked out in my basement. I have a little gym in my basement. And I have all kinds of weights down there, which I spent money on, whose sole function is to be lifted. I mean, think about that. It's just a weird, strange, bizarre thing to spend money on, on, on like pieces of heavy metal that you lift, right? And I have a treadmill down there, you know, a machine that's incredibly noisy and expensive and unpleasant and makes you work really hard and to get you absolutely nowhere, right? These are modern, strange things that nobody ever did until recently, right? So, so exercise in and of itself is is weird, right? But um, as your question uh, implied, you know, physical activity has also changed, right? And um, and we have this sort of notion that our ancestors were these incredible super athletes who went out and you know worked super super hard all day long and never sat and you know, um, but uh, in in reality they were reasonably hardworking. Um, the you know studies where we Put you know sensors on people in different parts of the world, like like farmers in Kenya where I work, or hunter gatherers where some of my students have, former students have collected data. It turns out your average hunter gatherer works you know between like two to four hours a day of moderate to vigorous physical activity. So that's getting your like a brisk walk or more. Um, they do a lot of course light 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 work as well throughout the day, um, but they also sit a lot too about nine nine ten hours a day. So. But the average American is maybe doing about twenty minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity a day. So, so 
there's about a six to tenfold increase, essentially, or, or decrease in, in, in modern Americans compared to what our ancestors did. And the other thing is that, as we mentioned before, and, and, and until recently, nobody would Tired. There was no such thing as retirement, right? People not only did this, they did it every day. There was no weekends. There were no holidays. You know, They did it every day and they did it throughout their lives until they were old. But in America, people, as they get older, we really seriously decrease our physical activity levels. And that's, that's a problem because study after study has shown that, that as you get older, exercise becomes more, not less important for health. Uh, so our our lifestyle is we're paying a, a price for it, we, we, and and that price is 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 alleviated to a large extent by by medical care. But isn't it better to prevent a disease rather than treat it? And and of course one of the best ways of preventing disease it's not the only one, but diet is important too. But but physical activity is unquestionably critical for preventing many many diseases. I think it's really key that we hone in on what you said um, very early on, which is physical activity versus exercise. And I think that it, a lot of us, especially doctors, so being a doctor, I will own this, is when we're in our office, we'll often tell people and we'll kind of say it as a throwaway statement, like, okay, just make sure you're getting your exercise or, you know, get out there and get some exercise, which may leave people feeling frustrated, nervous, they don't know what that means, they don't know how much, um, versus physical activity, Yeah, which is, you know, do the things you need to do um, for life, get up, sweep the floor, um, go out there and garden or dance or do something that is fun for you. So I'd, I'd love you to talk a little bit more about, about that. Sure. Well, I mean, the reason I called the book Exercised is that people today are exercised about exercise, right? They're they're anxious, they're confused, they feel a little bullied. You know, I mean, everybody knows that exercise is good for them. You don't have to tell them that. But but people don't like it. And because, and I think there's an ancient evolutionary origin for that, right? Because until recently, calories were limited, just like time is limited, right? The time you and I are talking right now is time that we will never get back, right? It's a it's it's a one-shot deal, right? And calories are also limited for most people still on the planet and were for all of our ancestors. And when you spend a calorie on one thing, you can't spend it on something else. And so when you're struggling to get enough calories, doing extra physical activity, which costs calories, is just a bad idea. So people have a deep-seated instinct to to not, you know, spend extra calories when they don't need to. And then all of a sudden we come along and say, hey, you need to exercise. And if you take the escalator or the elevator in, the, in your building, you're lazy. You know, if you don't get out and run marathons or, you know, whatever it is that you, you know, you're, you're lazy. And then we also sell it, right? You know, just do it, right? Um, so we've commodified it, we've medicalized it. But the problem is that, look, we know that that, that doesn't really work, right? You know, adherence to all kinds of medications is terrible. People don't even take their pills, right? So if you're not going to take your pill, how are you going to, you know, trudge on a treadmill for half an hour, especially when it's unpleasant? So I think that rather than continuing to kind of prescribe it and commercialize it and commodify it, nothing which is wrong. I mean, there's not there's nothing wrong with prescribing exercise, but we all every physician knows that it only goes so far, right? And there's nothing wrong with selling it or commercializing it. You know, that's fine too. But we know that you know only about twenty percent of Americans get even a moderate you know one hundred and fifty minutes a week of that's sort of recommended by every health organization. And I think we should try a kind of evolutionary anthropological approach to the problem, which is that we evolved to be physically active for two reasons and two reasons only. One, when it's necessary, and the other is when it's somehow rewarding, right? And we're not going to really make it necessary anymore, right? With machines and cars and Zoom and TVs and, you know, whatever. Um, so we, we need to make it necessary in a way that's also rewarding, right? And and I think the way to do that is to make it social, to make it fun, to make it... So if you tell somebody, hey, go out and walk every day, right, with, with your friends, that sounds good. But you say, go exercise every day, that doesn't sound good at all, right? Um, and if you, you know, like, well, what about like, hey, you should, you know, dance every day, right? People, every culture engages in dancing. Dancing is a, in fact, every culture you can find evidence for what I call endurance dancing. Um, why don't we do more dancing? It's a fantastic form of physical activity that we don't think of as exercise, but in a way it sort of is, right? And I could go on, there's plenty, you know, sports, soccer for kids, uh, you, know, um, you know, walks, jog with friends. I mean, you, you know, you can come up with all kinds of different ways of doing it, but, but I really think that making it social, making it fun, 
for all kinds of reasons that I could go elaborate is really, I think, uh, something that we don't really try hard enough to do. Yeah, I think that makes so much sense. One, I will say to you that for the first time in many months, I did go as I was reading your book and preparing for this interview to a standing um, treadmill desk. And I did walk on it for a few minutes in deference to to this conversation. So I did do that. And I did find it tedious and horrible <laughs> and couldn't keep track of my notes. Um, but the other thing that you said that I find so interesting is grandparents and as you age and what kind of physical activity you can do in a, in a social way. And I've, you know, there's a lot being written now about COVID and how it's basically created multi-generational households again, because we've needed so much help. People who have children are going back to work and their parents are moving into their homes to help them with child-related activities. And that's certainly happened in our home. My father came and uh, started living with us. And he, I say, is really the caretaker for all of us. He gets up at 6.30. He's 84 years old, gets up at 6.30, makes the chai for the entire household, gets the breakfast going for everybody, and then has a lot of times dinner ready when we get home. So oh, I just can I find say that with you? <laughs> <laughs> Indian food, anytime I you want it. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so can you talk a little bit about that? I saw that you, you know, you've been writing more on that and on that topic of grandparents and um, physical activity later into yeah. in, in life. Well, as, yeah, as we said before, I mean, I think this is this is special about human beings. Um, this is this is what we evolved to do. For most species, once they stop reproducing, they enter what what is famously called the selective shadow, the term invented by the Nobel laureate Sir Peter Medawar, who points out that you know once you're no longer having offspring, um, natural selection really ceases to care about you in most species, right? Because after all, all that natural selection cares about is how many offspring you have who survive and reproduce. But humans have figured out something really special in our, in our way of life that began maybe about 2 million years ago, the hunting and gathering way of life, which is that uh, we, uh, so mothers who are, who are out foraging, for example, um, usually don't, um, aren't able to produce enough food to pay for their own metabolic needs plus those of their children. And they rely on others to help them get the calories that they need, right? And th that others are, include their, gra their, their, their mothers, so grandmothers, um, also their partners, uh, grandparents, you know, grandfathers as well, others in the group, right? So we're, we're a cooperative species that helps each other. And importantly, so elder individuals like your, your father, that's what, that's what we've been doing for, for thousands and thousands of generations. Um, uh, the elders also, of course, provide wisdom and information and knowledge and, and, and they, they pass on other kinds of uh, important resources to their children and their grandchildren. And, and, and that's really special about human beings. And we've kind of stopped doing that in some ways, right? Because we no longer hunt and gather. We don't even, most of us don't farm. So we no longer really reliant on, on grandparents for, for that kind of labor. And as a result, um, grandparents, I think, are less and less active. And it's one of the reasons that uh, morbidity is on the rise. So there are many, many famous studies. My favorite is the one that was done right here. Um, it was the first major study ever done on aging and exercise by Ralph Paffenbarger, very famous paper, I'm sure. You read it many times, um, mm -hmm. um, published 1986 in New England Journal of Medicine, which um, showed that as people get older, their, their, their mortality rate declines enormously uh, with physical activity, and that, that decline in mortality increases with age. So a, like a 30 or 40-year-old individual who exercises 2,000 calories a week has about a, you know, I think it's about a 20% lower mortality rate. A 70-year-old who exercises the same amount has about a 50% lower mortality rate, and that's after controlling for other covariants. So, uh, you know, and this has been replicated many times in many studies. Uh, that was the first big one that that showed it, and um, and we know why that's the case because physical activity, uh, especially when you get older, turns on repair and maintenance mechanisms. So when you're when you're when you're being active. You're stressing your body, right? Your your mitochondria are producing reactive oxygen species, which are causing mutations, and you know you're glycating proteins. You're you know you're creating little muscle tears, and you know your bones get little micro cracks, and um, you know you you have a little hemolysis, and you know I could go on and on. You're stretching your arteries. I could, we could we could list thirty different kinds of stress that physical activity causes. But every single one of those stresses has a natural 
repair and maintenance mechanism that the body turns on. And every single one of them is turned on by physical activity. And the key thing is that in the past, people were never not physically active, as we've already discussed, right? You couldn't be a couch potato in your 60s back in the in the day because you, you know, your family would suffer, right? Um, so you wouldn't have any food and they wouldn't have any food. So we never evolved to turn these mechanisms on in the absence of physical activity. And in fact, that those repair and maintenance mechanisms turn out to be a key reason for how and why we're able to live so long. So, so physical activity is not only the, a reason to live longer, it actually helps us live longer. It's, it's part and parcel of the same process. So as we get older, we have this idea in our society that it's you know, normal to kind of take it easy and relax, but, but your father is showing us exactly what we're really meant to do, which is to stay active. And staying active keeps us healthy and, and, and turns on all kinds of mechanisms that we know are vital for delaying the onset of morbidity, hence various kinds of, you know, hence death. I think it's so interesting what you said also is that when we think of the word exercise, I think in a lot of people's minds, it's connected to conditions or what they want their outcome to be. So if I exercise, it's because I want to lose weight. Or if I exercise, it's because I want to put on some muscle and I want to look fit. Um, but we don't really talk about all of these other things. Every time you exercise, there are thousands of chemicals that are released into your body. There's genetic changes. There's immune cells that go out and hunt for uh, you know, things, there's mechanisms to repair the, the stress that's put on your body. So I think, is this a conversation that we need to change the way we frame how we, how we talk about things? <laughs> I couldn't agree more. I mean, the sad thing about, about our, the way we've sort of commercialized and commodified and to some extent medicalized exercise is it's primarily focused around, around weight. And ironically, exercise is not a great way to lose weight. You can lose weight exercising. It's just not if you want to lose a lot of weight fast, it's not the best way of doing it. But weight is just, you know, one of many contributors to health. And uh, there are so many other dimensions of exercise. Um, it's really, a, we're doing ourselves a serious disservice by focusing on one, one, one factor or another. And it's also why we'll never, ever, ever be able to put exercise in a pill. There are people constantly trying to find some biomolecule that's turned on to exercise that you put in pill form that you can sell for a lot of money. And you know some of them may have some benefits. They also may have side effects. Um, but you're never, ever, ever, ever going to come even close to the benefits of physical activity uh, from any, any kind of pharmaceutical. It's just not going to happen. It's impossible. It's, it's, there are, as you say, there are thousands of genes that are turned on by by physical activity. You can't turn that into a, any kind of prescription. There's, it's still the, the you know one of the ideal ways, if not the most important way, know, along with diet and stress relief and other things to to prevent illness. It's uh, it's still indispensable. That's great. So, in terms of changing the conversation, so in an evolutionary sense, does fit mean being ripped? I mean, is that what we're, you know, we're, we're looking for fitness. We're looking for health span. We're not necessarily looking for being ripped or muscular. Um, so can you talk a little bit about that? I mean, not that that is not a great side effect um, of exercise, but. <laughs> you know, back in the day, um, and by the day, I don't mean even that all that long ago, when people were struggling to get enough energy, you wanted to have enough muscle to do what you needed to do, but any extra is actually a tax. It's muscle is expensive, right? Uh, you know, if you do a serious weightlifting, you got to eat 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 a lot, right? You know, and so having extra muscle back when you're a hunter gatherer doesn't need to be all that strong was actually a detriment. So our ancestors, um, you know, they 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 had to do. They were reasonably strong. So if you look at percentile. If you look at graphs, of, for example, grip strength against age in different populations, like the United States or England, et cetera, where there's lots of data, and and then administer the same test to hunter gatherers, they're they're kind of like 75th percentile, you know, they're 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 you know on the higher end of being strong, but they're not they're not ripped, you know, um, and but the key difference is that as they age, they stay um, at a high percentile. Um, and they, they, their strength drops less as they age because, of course, you know they don't have can openers and escalators and elevators and and well, they don't have cans. Um, you know they have to stay physically active and they have to still use their their muscles to generate force. So strength 
so ma- is maintained more throughout age, and that's of course important because it prevents sarcopenia. And sarcopenia, you know, muscle wasting is a is one of the most you know sad and debilitating ways in which people age because as as people lose muscle mass um, and become more frail, they have a harder time doing physical activities, which then leads to a vicious cycle because then they're less physically active, which then kind of continues the sort of degradation that occurs from inactivity. Um, in terms of uh, other aspects of fitness, you know, they had high aerobic capacities, but not crazy high. They're not like Tour de France athletes that have, you know, high, super high VO2 maxes. You know, they're not, you know, when, when hunter gatherers run, for example, they're doing like a 10 minute mile, very nice gradual jog. They're not, they're not running marathons like, you know, modern elite marathons or is that, you know, at like five minute miles crazy. It's amazing that anybody could do that um, for 26 miles, you know. Um, so, so they're, they're, they're reasonably fit. They're reasonably strong, but they're not crazy fit. They're not crazy strong, and they're not, you know, doing ridiculous amounts of physical activity. They're just doing moderate levels, but on a regular basis, day after day after day after day. And we know that, you know, all the epidemiological data tell us the same thing. If you're sedentary, your rate of mortality goes up. But if you just exercise 150 minutes a week, that's that's 21 minutes a day. Your mortality rate, your all-cause mortality rate for a given age. Drops by about about thirty percent, in and if you get to up to a level of a hunter gatherer, you get about another ten percent or so. You get down to about a forty percent, and then it kind of levels off. So there's no, you don't need to do crazy amounts of physical activity to get the benefits of it. And importantly, only a little bit, just a titch, will have enormous effects. Right. So. Uh, so that, I think it's one of the misconceptions that we have that you know our ancestors were these ripped, super strong, super athlete you know people who you know got up in the morning and just like decided to run ultra marathons or whatever. They neither did that nor was it any that would that have been any 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 benefit. So you know, that brings me to another question. So then, if we're spending out, so they had it sounds like bursts of activity throughout the day. So can we make up for a day spent sitting? Uh, eight hours spent sitting um, by doing 20 minutes of, you know, moderate to vigorous exercise every day? Or are we really talking about trying to do that plus getting up as much as possible, walking around as much as possible? What what are your thoughts on that? Well, the evidence is that what well, kind of both is important, right? So, um, so certainly um, if you look at, um, at the epidemiological data and say mortality rates uh, or or heart disease rates, for example, incidents um, with um, with physical activity, it's much more closely correlated to to leisure time physical activity than than work time physical activity. So people who who you know work sitting down, and most of us have jobs that require us to sit down um, for a lot of the day, um, and then if they if they commute to work sitting down and then come home and sit down after dinner watching TV, you know we, we all know the routine, right? We're much more vulnerable to disease um, and various forms of aging when we do that. So it's also true that um, that we sit a fair amount. Um, Hunter gatherers sit a fair amount, but when we sit, uh, we tend to sit for much longer bouts than than our ancestors, right? And we tend to sit in chairs that have backrests and things like that. And a number of studies, and it's a growing field of research, show that just getting up every once in a while. Even if you're not doing anything serious, go make a cup of tea, go to the bathroom, you know, go pet your dog, or you know, mind a child, or something like that. All of that, um, it kind of you know turns your muscles on a little bit. It's a bit like turning your car engine on in the driveway. You know, you're not you're not using a huge amount of energy, but you do burn up some of the fats and and sugars that are in your bloodstream. You turn on various genes, and so it's shown that you can two people can sit the same amount, but the person who gets up on a sort of every 10, 15 minutes. Uh, like our ancestors did, um, reaps quite a lot of metabolic benefit. So I think the answer is, you know, if you are sitting all day long because you have a job, that's not a bad thing, and you can certainly make up for that by exercising. But it is good to try to get up every once in a while, just turn the machinery on. Uh, you'll also get a benefit from that as well. I love that. So it's not pr- procrastination when you get up and walk away from the work you're supposed to do. It's actually something you're doing for your health. I love love that advice. Absolutely. <laughs> and a couple of final 
questions before I let you go. So one is, what do you think about our attempt to sort of hack exercise? So you hear about the one minute hit program that is going <laughs> to give you a, a whole bunch of health benefits. So what's, you know, what's the evolutionary correlate? Because you do see some evidence, not the one minute program, but there are certain, there are certainly, you know, some evidence for hit um, for certain health conditions. So what do you, how does that fit in? Mm, great question. So, you know, when we commodify and commercialize exercise, we, we we tend to, you know, everybody has their their preferred kind, right? And they're they're the you know they're the people who love strength training and can't stand cardio and the reverse. And there's the people who push hit, you know, high intensity interval training. And then there's people who push just you know walking is fine. People who push, you know, and the answer is that they're all fine. They're all good for you, um, but we never evolved to do one thing. Um, and you know, I think study after study shows that uh, you know it's a mixture that's that seems to be optimal, right? If you look at diabetes, you look at heart disease, you know, it's some combination of these uh, that are important. I mean, aerobic physical activity is definitely the bedrock, I would say, of any any exercise regime. You know, you just want to have high fitness and, you know, that's what's most important for your cardiovascular system. It's also obviously important for diseases like cancer and diabetes, but you can also get a lot of benefit from strength training. And as we get older, strength training becomes increasingly important. And it's certainly the case that um, high intensity interval training of some sort, you know, or you can just call it intensity, you know, some degree of intensity has all kinds of benefits. It turns on systems that aren't turned on by just a long, you know, by just a walk, for example. And I don't think you need to be a, an MD or a PhD or whatever to realize that, you know, some, some, some mixture of these things is probably the best thing. But I do want to caution against this idea of an optimal exercise regime. You know, people are often saying, you know, this is what you should do. And they come up with some opt, you know, as if there's like a U-shaped curve. And if you're on one side of it, you're going to not getting enough. And then there's this perfect balance. And then that you kind of, that doesn't exist, right? And, and it never will exist and it can't exist. And it's a foolish idea, right? Because first of all, everybody's different. Your gender, your age, your physical activity background, your injury history, the diseases you're worried about. Are you worried about cancer? Are you worried about heart disease? Are you worried about Alzheimer's? Are you worried about, you know, your mental health, etc. I mean, they're all going to be different conditions, and there's no way to say that there's one perfect exercise prescription. It's just a. I mean, it's always going to be the same, which is that some is better than none. You know, a little bit more tends to be a bit better. The benefits will eventually level off, and mixing it up is never a bad idea. And beyond that, we should just relax. I, I think that that's a great bit of sort of removing the judgment and the stress from the word exercise. Um, I think, you know, as we kind of learn more about these conditions, we can say downstream, one is a brain condition, one is a heart condition, one is, you know, a kidney condition. But if we go upstream, they're really coming from some of the same types of behaviors um, that we're doing that lead us down the path of high blood pressure or, you know, cognitive decline. So I think if we're going upstream and we're talking about prevention, then we're really talking about doing like what you said, you know, exercise at some level, whatever works for us and more is better. So what's your own exercise sort of origin story or your own sort of regimen at, at this point? Have you always been an exerciser? Did you start at some point? Well, I mean, I've always been reasonably active. My, 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 I got into running because of my mother who who started running in the 1960s to liberate a gym that they built at the University of Connecticut and they wouldn't let women use it. So she started running to liberate the gym. And um, I described the, my mother in the book. And so I grew up, you know, my, my parents left to hike. And so I grew, we grew up hiking and skiing and, and jogging. And, but I never was a, I was, you know, I, I really was that cliched sort of kid who was picked last for most teams. You know, I've never been a, been a great athlete. Um, but I enjoyed, you know, getting out and walking and running and, playing soccer and things like that. And, and I was sort of, I stayed reasonably active throughout my life. Um, but when I started studying the evolution of running, that really kind of kicked things up a notch for me. I started getting invited to marathons to give lectures. And I thought, well, you know, I should try to try one one of these days. And actually the very first time I put a number on my chest was, was to run in a marathon in my forties. So um, I'd never run even a 5k race. So, um, so I'm kind of a late in life kind of more, more serious athlete. Um, but, um, but it's been really um, wonderful for me, and I've made so many friends and enjoyed it. And it's been a key part of my life. C can I return to a topic though that that you covered a little earlier? Yeah, uh, about please. about about because you mentioned all these diseases and exercise, and I also wanted to mention 
that one of the things that we're learning about so many diseases that afflict people is that uh, they're, they're related to inflammation. And we all know that inflammation is partly caused by, by, by obesity, so especially visceral fat, um, which is very pro-inflammatory. But one of the things that we've been learning recently is that um, the, the major way that the body turns... So, so exercise is good because it helps reduce visceral fat. Fine. But the other thing that we're learning is that the major molecules, the, the major cytokines that regulate inflammation aren't produced by our immune system. They're actually produced by our muscles, myokines. Cytokines, cytokines that come from muscle, myokines. And so when, when, when skeletal muscle is active, when you go out and do stuff, we're actually regulating inflammation. And so that's why exercise is so important for every inflammatory related disease you can think of. Alzheimer's, nothing comes close to exercise for preventing Alzheimer's. Atherosclerosis and high blood pressure, nothing comes close to it. And of course, diet is also important too, but exercise is important. Uh, cancers, many cancers are the the rate the the, the incidence of cancer is considerably re reduced, especially uh, breast cancers, um, colon cancer, etc. Uh, by by physical activity, uh, the list goes on and on and on and on. Diabetes, etc. So, and it's because of this, uh, uh, because exercise really helps tamp down inflammation as well as turn on repair and maintenance mechanisms that are needed to repair the damage that's caused by an inflammation. So, again, you know, you don't. Need to do that much, um, but but we never evolved not to do it, and 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 I think that's the key. It's a mismatch to be not physically active. So we often talk about exercise as medicine, right? But really, it's a better way of thinking about it from an evolutionary perspective. Is that's the absence of physical activity increases your vulnerability to a wide range of diseases. So it's the absence of exercise that's just that's sort of anti medicinal. I love that. So if I have got it correctly, please add what you think I've missed. So if we want to turn something that we have not evolved to do into something that we find rewarding, we should do it in groups, find social connection, do as much as we can, and try to do the antidote of, of being inactive. Am I missing anything? Oh, I mean, that's, yeah. I mean, we all kind of, everybody kind of knows that, right? You know, have fun. If it's fun, you'll do it. If it's not fun, you'll find a way to follow your instincts, right? Uh, you know, I often say, you know, think about it when you're in a, we've all been there in a, in a mall or a subway stop or, you know, airport where there's an escalator next to a stairway, right? There were no escalators in the Stone Age, right? But everybody crowds onto the escalator instead of the, stair, the stairway, even knowing full well they should take the stairs, right? Why? Because it's a deep and fundamental instinct to save energy, right? And it's not that these people are lazy, there's always anything wrong with them. It's just, they're just being normal, right? So we need, how do we make, get people to take the stairs? Well, shaming and blaming them is not very effective. Right, <laughs> that just pisses people off, myself included. Right, but if you make the stairs fun or, or rewarding, like hey, you know, you say if you meet you, your other friends are on the stairs, well, you're going to take the stairs with them, so you can ch chat to them, and by chatting with them as you go up the stairs, you'll have a good time and you'll reward each other in various ways, and and it ceases to be exercise. It's just a pleasant way to get from here to there. Right, and so the more we make physical activity is social, the more reward we'll get from it, the more we'll benefit we'll get from it. And, and, um, and, you know, you don't, and again, we don't, and we don't need to make people feel like they have to do crazy amounts to get some benefit. Just, you know, adding a few minutes a day um, can have a huge effect. And eventually, slowly, you can add a little bit more. But, you know, you don't need to do a huge amount to get an enormous benefit. Well, thank you. And I, I have to say that this conversation was incredibly rewarding for me as well. Thank you for listening to this episode of Health Discovered from WebMD. I'm Dr. Neha Batak. Before you go, please take a moment to subscribe to Health Discovered wherever you listen to podcasts. Stay well, and I'll talk to you next time. 